everybody. Welcome to the Ron Line Report. Today's guest has a great story to tell. A lot of us grew up idolizing Arnold Schwarzenegger, influenced, motivated by the man, uh, not only as a bodybuilder, but as, a, as an actor and governor, all the things that Arnold was and still is. And uh, a lot of us fantasized that we could have worked out with Arnold. We could have gone, hung out on the movie set with Arnold, done all these cool things with Arnold. Well, today's guest is a gentleman named Scott Barron from Chicago who did just that back in 1992. First of all, thanks for joining us today, Scott. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I've been really looking forward to this. It is a great honor to be on the run line of port with muscular development. So uh, this take us back to how this all began. It was uh, you were just a kid, 18 years old in 1992. 18 years of age, wow. going on 19, soon to be a college student, so kind of a college, quote-unquote, bodybuilder, yeah. really more of a, a hobbyist weightlifter, yeah. to be uh, accurate. 26 years ago, yeah. I can't believe that, 26 years ago, I remember it vividly, I had just gotten back from a local gym from a weightlifting session. I happened to be reading through a bodybuilding magazine when I stumbled across an advertisement for the Arnold Classic, the fourth annual Arnold Classic to be held in Columbus, Ohio at the Veterans Memorial Stadium yeah. uh, in the auditorium there. And I remember reading in fine print that they were to hold a raffle drawing and the winner would win an all expense paid trip to work out with Arnold on his movie set and essentially uh, get to spend time with them, a couple of days with them. Wow. For some reason, somehow, some way, I had a very, very strong intuition that I was going to win that trip. Huh. And I'm not saying that. I actually told my parents. I told a number of my friends. Just somehow, I really, really felt I was going to win that trip. Hmm. Now, of course, the major challenge, being only 18 years of age, is to get financing to get to Chicago, to Columbus, Ohio. $250 was the cost for the VIP package. Wow. With, <laughs> I mean, what a deal. I mean, it is so looking back on it, it's so reasonable. Yeah. You got tickets to the pre judging, to the finals. You also got tickets to see Miss International. You got a Polaroid picture with Arnold Schwarzenegger himself. Ryan, I'm feeling old. A Polaroid picture. I, mean, I remember Polaroid. I'm older than you. I remember Polaroids vividly. <laughs> a lot of people are not even familiar with uh, what Polaroid pictures are. As well as a dinner banquet and a uh, training seminar the following day. So the, the big challenge was for me to secure financing. $250 plus hotel accommodations. Yeah. So I approached my parents and I kind of promoted it. Hey, this would be a birthday and a Christmas present wrapped up into one. Yeah. And they knew what a positive uh, motivational uh, impact and influence Arnold had. It got me uh, really excited about lifting weights and going to the gym, along with millions of people worldwide. Yeah. One thing I do want to point out, I truly, firmly believe that Arnold Schwarzenegger was at the pinnacle of his movie star uh, fame at yeah. that period of time. This was not long after uh, the release of Terminator 2, yeah. which did more than $500 million. Just a great, great movie. Special effects still hold up even today. Yeah. Just an awesome story. And Arnold, I believe, was at the height of his fame. So uh, winning that trip uh, definitely uh, would have meant the world to me. And as it turned out, uh, my prediction uh, had come true. But there is a very interesting backstory. So my uh, parents graciously, generously had agreed to finance the trip. So uh, I end up uh, checking into the Hyatt Hotel on Capitol Square. It no longer exists. They converted that to a Sheridan Hotel. Hyatt, I believe, a, a built a brand new facility, hotel, relatively close proximity. 
So I checked into the Hyatt on Capitol Square, approximately four blocks away from Veterans Memorial Auditorium. And I just was unpacking my things. I remember wanting to take a shower after the commit. I'm getting on, uh, out of the shower and the TV news, the local TV news happened to be on. And uh, my luck here, the uh, newscaster said, we are live here at the Hyatt on Capitol Square in the fitness center, waiting the arrival of Arnold Schwarzenegger for <laughs> interview regarding the Schwarzenegger uh, class act. Hmm. So needless to say, I grabbed my whole video camera and I quickly ran towards the elevator. I mean, I still was dripping wet from the towel. I, I had put my shirt on backwards. I didn't care. My number one goal was uh, I thought it would be very, very cool to get an up-close look at the legend himself. Right. So I made my way to the elevator, went up to the 23rd floor. I was the very last individual that they even allowed to uh, go into the fitness center because hmm. it was getting relatively crowded with onlookers as Arnold was in the process of being interviewed. The interview lasted about five or six minutes, and I remember at the conclusion of it, and I'm recording this uh, the entire time. Yeah. Then Arnold and a couple of business associates made their way towards uh, the gym exit, and he walked right past me by maybe only two or three feet. And I got excellent VHS tape home movie uh, footage of that. And I just felt in my heart of hearts that this was my lucky weekend to win that trip. <laughs> Here, I'm only in Columbus less than one hour, and I get to see the legend himself. So what, what a great experience. What a premonition. So when was the actual raffle held during the weekend? Well, I remember in 1992, after the exciting conclusion where Vince Taylor won first uh, prize, uh, mm. Mohammed Benaziza won second, mm. Sonny Schmidt won third place. Wow. And uh, I remember that they were going to have a dinner banquet where they were going to hold the raffle drawing immediately following uh, the conclusion of the bodybuilding event. Yeah. Now, the problem is, this was my very first time at Veterans. Uh, I was unfamiliar with uh, where the North Hall was. Mm -hmm. That's where it was to be held. So, as the people were exiting the auditorium, I struck up a conversation uh, with someone, uh, I believe he was about maybe three or four years older than I. I asked him if he knew whether uh, where the North uh, Hall was. And uh, he said he did, and to follow him, he was going there. We talked about weightlifting and training. I remember having a light dinner with him, and we really got along quite well. Well, something kind of odd, yet magical, had happened. About 30 minutes prior to uh, the raptor drawing, he notified me that he was going to leave. He was very, very tired. Apparently, earlier in the day, he had to commute all the way uh, to Columbus, Ohio. It was a long road trip. And he gave me his raffle ticket. Hmm. And I tried to stop him. And I said, I, well, are you kidding me? They're going to have this raffle in only about 30 minutes' time. Yeah. You know, who knows? You could be the lucky winner. After all, people do win state lotteries, which is out of millions and millions and millions of people. I said, this is a raffle drawing, maybe out of three or 4,000 people. Who knows? You could be the lucky winner. Hmm. Not exactly what he said, but it's how he said it. He said, you know, I, I'm too tired. I got to go uh, to the hotel. I, I just need to crash. Here's my ticket. Now you have two chances to hmm. win. So the announcement was made that the raffle drawing was to be held. They actually had to call three ticket numbers three times each. I guess apparently a lot of people had already left for their hotel rooms. Hmm. Um, and finally when they called the uh, fourth ticket number, they called my raffle ticket. And it was the ticket that he had given Wow earlier. Wow. Unbelievable. So, wow. you know, 
this week, even though I thought I was going to win, I notified uh, friends and family. I felt I was going to win. When I actually won, Ron, I had the feeling of going down a very, very fast roller coaster. You know, with that, just that adrenaline rush. Yeah. The excitement. I just, yeah, you know, part of me, I believed it, but then again, I couldn't believe it because of the fact it was given. Um, I had won it on a ticket that was given to me. So what an experience. Now, here's the challenge. I had started trembling. I mean, I just was overjoyed, the adrenaline. Now I had to make my way up to the podium where Arnold Schwarzenegger was, okay, and to shake his hand and to accept the prize. And I just remember the entire, I mean, there were hundreds of people there, Ron. Yeah. And the entire background, everything, was a blur. Hmm. And I'm walking up to the legendary Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he shakes my hand, and he said, congratulations on winning. We're going to fly you up to California. We're going to have a great time. We're going to work out together. We're going to hang out together. You're going to uh, see me on the movie set. So congratulations on winning. And then he said, whoa, wait a second here. Relax. You're shaking like a leaf. <laughs> You've already won. Yeah. For land. And uh, so he made a joke out of it. And, you know, that's pretty much what I can remember. Other than being grabbed by the arm by an older gentleman, a very, very calm uh, individual who took me to the side. He got my contact information, my first and last name, my address, my phone number. He wanted to know my age. Yeah. And then he gave me his business a card. And I remember it was a very calming um, influence here because, you know, my adrenaline was going at a million miles per hour. And it turned out to be none other than the legendary Jim Lorimer. I was going to say, I bet it was Jim Lorimer. <laughs> and, uh, he chose an unbelievable uh, individual. And, uh, you know, I was doing a little bit of research uh I'm Jim Lorimer. Um, he served uh, in the Navy. And then uh, a lot of people don't know this, but he's a Penn State law grad. And he actually was a special agent with the FBI for several years. Yep. But prior to uh, working about 30 or 35 years in the insurance uh, industry. And I think a, a strong case could be made that uh, Jim Lorimer uh, potentially is the greatest bodybuilder or a bodybuilding promoter of yeah. all time. Of course, along with Joe Weider, you know, obviously. But definitely, um, it was uh, just a great experience. Yeah, Scott, we had, I had him, I was lucky enough to get him on Ron Line, I guess it was about three, maybe four months ago, and... What a great guy. He's so sharp as a tack. I believe he's about 90 years old now or maybe more. And uh, one, another, all the stuff you said is pretty impressive, but he's also been either the mayor or the deputy mayor uh, of Worthington, Ohio, continuously since something like 1967. So, that's absolutely correct. That's I crazy. Mean, you know what's, uh, what impresses me most? He is this down-to-earth individual yeah. i mean there is no pretense with jim Lorimer. i mean he's just so down to earth and i remember that i had to contact him several times by the time i won the trip until 10 months later when i flew to uh, california to see arnold and he always was so nice so professional on the phone i remember one phone call i mean obviously i spaced these phone calls out by a couple of months i mean it was nearly a year's time yeah. um one time i believe he was in the midst of a meeting and uh it, it didn't bother him at all he took uh, several minutes uh on the phone and he uh, told me uh, be patient these things take time be ready and I'm going to contact you as soon as we know uh, what movie is script and what uh, movie Arnold's going to produce. Wow. So now I win this trip. My adrenaline is going at a million miles per hour. This is really before cell phones, with the exception of those huge brick phones, which yeah. were very, very expensive at that we, time. We didn't have those. We had beepers if we were lucky. 
Right, absolutely. And I remember I just felt this sense of urgency of having to get from Veterans Memorial Auditorium to the Hyatt to play some international or uh, long distance phone calls uh, back to Chicago to tell uh, friends and family, hey, remember I, when I said I was going to win? Guess what? I won. And I remember running full speed. I mean, it, it was unbelievable. I made record time. So I get back to the uh, Hyatt Hotel completely out of breath. I'm like gasping for air. <laughs> my way onto the elevator yeah. and uh, actually the doors were ready to close and I just got there in time and the doors reopened I got uh, got in the elevator and there were uh, two gentlemen on the elevator one of them being legendary Franco Colombo hmm. and I remember telling Arnold this story and he got a great kick out of this uh, <laughs> Ron, to be honest Franco Colombo, unfortunately, wasn't very nice to me. Mm. He, made he said, young man, you're out of breath here. You're completely out of breath. You're out of shape. You need to get into shape. And I said, I recognized him immediately. And I said, hey, Franco, well, guess what? I just won that trip with Arnold, the Rample drawing that's going to allow me to fly out there to California. And I ran full speed all the way here. He had no idea what I was even talking about. I heard this expression, he looked at me as if I was absolutely, positively out of my mind. <laughs> oh my, I want to go out of order here just briefly. Yeah. Now, Ten months later, I'm riding shotgun with Arnold Schwarzenegger behind the wheel of the very first civilian H1 Hummer. Hmm. We are going down the Los Angeles freeway, and Arnold drives fast. He's got these cool sunglasses on. And I remember uh, telling him about this story, and his face just lit up. He found it to be absolutely hilarious. And he immediately, he said, watch this. And he picks up his car phone. Now, yeah, you know, a lot of people are so, so used to iPhones that they don't remember, well, back in the day, there were car phones. Right. And he immediately picked it up and called Franco Colombo's office. <laughs> and he wanted to joke with him about it. Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm just kind of assuming here, but I think that probably the receptionist said that uh, he uh, was out at the office. Yeah. So I wasn't able to, uh, you know, well, to hear Arnold joke with Franco about that. Yeah. So the bottom line is uh, my prediction had come true. I won uh, a trip with uh, the number one action movie star anywhere in the world, the highest paid actor, the most famous bodybuilder anywhere in the world. And here I won an absolutely uh, remarkable opportunity to actually hang out with him. So you get out there, it's early 1993. You're like 19 years old at this point, right? Um, it was Almost 1993. By the okay. time I got out there, uh, it was December of 1992. Okay. There was a 10-month wait. Um, one thing, I've done some research, and there, there was actually a long period of time. Uh, Terminator 2 came out in 1991 in the theaters. Yep. And then Last Action Hero came out in 1993 in mm -hmm. theaters. Now, Arnold had always produced at least one major movie, if not two, per year. Right. So looking back on this, uh, there was a two-year period of time. Well, I, I really didn't know the reason for that until I kind of put two and two together when I read his biography, uh, Total Recall. Um, he actually spent some time in Japan filming a number of commercials. I believe there were about four or five commercials uh, that he filmed. He got paid as much as $5 million for each commercial. And in his book, he writes that some of them, he was able to finish filming in just one day. Hmm. So he was actually very, very busy, but you know, we didn't know this because you know, he was filming uh, commercials halfway around the world. Right. 
which never aired. I think Stallone did that, and the, the stipulation was that they would never air in the U.S. Right. So, yeah. That, that is correct. He, didn't want to, he did not want to ruin uh, the Arnold image or the Arnold brand. And he writes in his book, of course, nowadays with uh, social media and YouTube, you can never get away with arrangements like that. Right. Definitely the world has changed. So, Scott, did you have an itinerary that was sent to you ahead of time? Did you know exactly what you were going to be doing uh, it, during this two days out in L.A., This, which yeah. I'm sure went by in the blink of an eye? Yeah, um, Jim Laura Murr had been also one of Arnold's uh, personal assistants, and I must say that she actually still works for him all of these years later. Uh, she sent me the airline tickets and uh, a, a nice letter, a detailed letter, indicating what the schedule would be. And uh, I flew out there, and I stayed at a very nice hotel within walking distance, um, located in Santa Monica from Arnold's uh, office. And uh, upon check-in there, I was to contact his office, which I did, and they gave me a personal tour. Arnold was not in the office at that particular time, but they gave me a tour of uh, his office. Uh, just unbelievable. It's a very impressive space yeah. filled with Arnold memorabilia, trophies, movie posters. Uh, I'm, I'm going to interrupt. Just, I was lucky enough to go there once myself, and... Same as you, Arnold. Well, you you actually hung out with Arnold, but I never got to see Arnold on that trip. But the first thing I remember walking in was the full size uh, Terminator. You know, the skeleton, the robot skeleton with the with the red eyes and the big gun. That's like right. the very first thing when you walk in. Uh, that's just overwhelming because it's and, an iconic image from from his movies. Absolutely. And at that period of time, this was not long after the release of Terminator Two. But I remember. He had a Terminator 2 pinball machine yeah. and a Terminator 2 uh, video arcade machine there uh, as well. Yeah. But I gotta mention here, what's also impressive is Arnold owns that entire building, which takes up a city block in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the office is really, really impressive. And I'll never forget some of the silk screen paintings uh, done by Andy Warhol that Arnold had, and uh, it's just uh, his office was tastefully done, but really uh, quite amazing, quite overwhelming, uh, yeah. to, to be honest. Uh, you, I saw pictures with him uh, with presidents, former presidents, other politicians, and um, it, it, it really, it's an overwhelming, uh, but a cool experience. Yeah. Now, did you have like a driver or a handler, or were you kind of on your own to get where you needed to go during this whole experience? Well, his office took care of uh, like the uh, the taxi ride to and from uh, the airport uh, each way, um, and then uh, really since my hotel was only about seven or eight blocks away from his office, uh, it, there really I didn't need a, a handler there because okay. uh, when I saw Arnold. The following day, all of the transportation was going to be done in its very first civilian H1 Hummer. Nice. And that was absolutely incredible. Yeah. So I remember the following morning, um, I believe it was about 8 a.m., I'm at World Gym. Hmm. I'm on the stationary bike. I do have to make mention there was one other individual uh, who joined me. That individual actually had won the raffle drawing the previous year. Hmm. Can you imagine? I had to wait 10 months. I mean, it felt like forever because you're so excited. Yeah. You had to wait one year and 10 months. <laughs> Almost two years. <laughs> so uh, we're at World Gym and we're warming up on the stationary bike when in walks in Arnold Schwarzenegger. And this was uh, the World Gym uh, on Main Street. Yeah. Not too far from his office, within a mile, uh, I would say, from his office. And I just remember um, what, what an experience, because you know, I've got the Terminator walking right towards me. Yeah. Again, it was kind of like that roller coaster type of feeling, uh, just kind of like a surreal uh, experience. Um, 
but Arnold uh, was uh, very, uh, very nice. Asked each of us where we were from, and uh, I mentioned Chicago, and he said, a great city. I filmed Red Heat there. I filmed Raw Deal there. That's right. I love Chicago, so that was a very nice uh, icebreaker. He was able to make a connection with only a 19-year-old, which put me at ease. Hmm. So did you? was this a workout? Did you guys get to train with him that morning? Absolutely. We're at World Gym, and I remember the legendary Joe Gold was <laughs> working out on the stationary uh, bike just yards away. Yeah. And uh, we did a chest and back workout. I would say we completed approximately 30 sets total. Uh, I remember doing the lat pull down machine. I remember doing it was all uh, machine work. Yeah. Uh, chest fly machine, uh, the bench press machine, um, and then also the abdominal machine. One or two others. So the yeah. workout I would say lasted for about one hour, maybe an hour and a half. And it was just a great time. And Arnold has an amazing, kind of like his sarcastic, but an amazing sense of humor. Yeah. So many people at the gym, they obviously, they see him there all the time, that they're familiar with him. And uh, one uh, member sarcastically said, what, Arnold, are you a personal trainer now? <laughs> I got back immediately to him. He said, that's right, and I get to charge $80,000 per hour. <laughs> what a great response. But I was thinking about it while researching for this interview. If he's getting paid $5 million for, to film a commercial in yeah. Japan, you break it down, and he was so famous internationally at that point in time, Probably spot on the accurate. He could have charged eighty thousand dollars per hour. Of course. So, <laughs> one of my favorite pictures of that entire trip is not so much with Arnold, or he also introduced me to Clint Eastwood. I can't wait to tell you about that next. But was the picture that I got with the late legendary Joe Gold? Mm. I can't tell you how much uh, that that particular photo uh, means. And I look back, and uh, for those people that don't know, he was at the founder of both Gold's Gym and World's Gym. He yeah. founded Gold's, the original Gold's, in 1965. He had sold that actually in 1970, but later uh, he founded the original World Gym in 1977. Yeah. I was doing some research on him, and I knew all of that. And he designed almost all of the machines. I yeah. mean, he was a legendary artist with what he could do with his, uh, designing um, weightlifting equipment. I knew he was a merchant marine. Yeah. But when I did research, I had no idea that he actually served in the United States Navy. Mm -hmm. He served honorably in World Wars II and in Korea. Hmm. Yeah. I didn't know this, but in World War II, that um, he was actually torpedoed, where he was severely injured. Hmm. And I, I never, never realized that. But uh, what, what a legend! And yeah. uh, it meant so much for me to get that picture. But also, I realized one thing that really, really touched my heart regarding uh, Joe Gold. And uh, I, I read uh, a story. Yeah, or I heard it on a YouTube uh, interview, that Bill Pettis, for those people that don't know Bill Pettis, at one time in the early 70s, it was rumored he had the largest biceps anywhere in the world. And they measured out at like 23 inches. Right. He was known as the gentle giant. Um, he had a little bit of fame. Uh, a photographer took a famous uh, photograph of uh, Bill Pettis in 1984 leading up to the Summer Olympics in LA. Hmm. And they had a picture of Bill Pettis uh, working out with weights. Well, in later years, apparently, um, I, I believe that he may have suffered from some mental health issues yeah. and was borderline homeless at one point. And Joe Gold allowed Bill Pettis to actually stay at World Gym and to sleep there during the evenings and assigned him with the task, keep an eye on the parking lot, you know, keep an eye on the place and all of that. 
that to me really symbolizes the character of Joe Gold. I mean, that really touched me when I learned that information. And uh, I just want to interject that, Jim, because it's no longer there. And, you know, a lot of these people watching this never got the chance to see that that flagship world Jim is on Main Street, which I don't believe it was the original. I believe he had an original one in Santa Monica uh, in 77, and then this one was built a few years later. But it was like a cathedral. It had these enormous high ceilings, wooden beams, every huge wooden beams, huge skylights. There was no music. Uh, you couldn't drop weights. If you drop weights, Joe would kick you out. <laughs> And uh, it was just, a, it was a totally different, and it had an outdoor workout deck uh, with all kinds of machines and free weights. You know, I remember the natural light, you're correct, the sun, I mean, the, the architecture of that particular world gym location was absolutely incredible. Mm. And, and you're right, I mean, I kind of laughed there because uh, Joe Gold, from what I learned, uh, he did not like music, he did not like people trapping weights. And uh, apparently he had a number of idiosyncrasies. I mean, he was a funny individual, a yeah. character. And I was kind of thinking that somebody could probably write a book. And if they don't write a book, at least a long uh, article. And I would love for them to compare and contrast Vince Geronda of Vince's gym yeah. with Joe Gold. I think that would be so interesting. Yeah. You know, speaking of Vince Geronda, just briefly, I remember watching a Larry Scott YouTube interview, and Larry Scott reflected on when he first met Vince Geronda, and he said, hello, my name is Larry Scott, and Vince looks at him and says, so what? I mean, <laughs> these were, you know, very comical, legendary people. Do you remember uh, Vince's first response to Arnold? Uh, I believe he said, uh, Arnold said, hi, my name is Arnold Schwarzenegger, Mr. Universe. And Vince says, so what? You look like a fat fuck to me. Yes. Excuse my language, but I believe <laughs> that was Vince. Exactly. <laughs> so you had the workout. So what was the next What was the next thing on the schedule well, that you got to do? Well, I remember riding shotgun in Arnold's H1 Hummer. And then we had this small drive from the World Gym location to his office, approximately one mile away. And I just remember being overwhelmed with just how cool uh, that the Hummer actually was. I mean, this was brand new, the first civilian uh, model. And I remember a lot of people honking their horns because they immediately recognized Arnold. I mean, even oncoming traffic, people honking their horns or waving. Well, let, let's be clear, Scott. This was the only Hummer on the road in the United States of America, right? Absolutely. Wow. And uh, Arnold, I believe, had a key role in bringing uh, the Humvee yeah. to get transitioned to be a Hummer for uh, civilians. And I, I believe that he worked... Uh, uh, with uh, the logistics, I'm making that uh, possible. So yeah, I believe it was the very first one. Hmm. And so we ended up at Shatsi on Main, the restaurant Shatsi meaning sweetheart or darling in German. And let me tell you just one thing, Ron, that restaurant was awesome. Yeah. Arnold he had uh, opened that and uh, I just remember the decor. Um, it, it was a very kind of fancy yet cozy type of decor. I remember they also had an outdoor uh, patio seating availability. Uh, it just was a, a, a great restaurant. We happen to have uh, a breakfast of oatmeal with raisins. Uh, I remember bananas. We had a fresh, uh, a huge bowl of fresh strawberries and coffee. Hmm. And uh, just, just great. We took a number of pictures there as well. So after that, he brings uh, us, I should say us, because of the previous year's raffle winner. I believe from time to time, there would be one or two people, I believe from the movie set, who would join us. I'm not exactly sure of who they were. I right. can't remember. It's been about 26 years. But Arnold uh, brought us up and gave us a second personal tour uh, of his office. And uh, again, it, it just is quite the space, to say the least. Yeah. And, um, you know, Shotsi Main, is that, if that's part of that same block that he owned, right? 
Correct. It was on the at the bottom level of the uh, three-story building. He owns the entire building. Um, and I believe that Shotzi had a very successful run for approximately 10 years. Uh, it's very decent for a restaurant in L.A. Absolutely. Right anywhere. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was great, great food, great service, and, and just a very uh, relaxing, a cozy type of atmosphere. So uh, we went up to his office. He gave us another tour. I, I remember way in the back somewhere that he showed me this separate room that was all wooden. And he had titled that his Austrian room because it reminded him of uh, the decor, the rustic decor back home uh, in Austria. So that it just was, it was an emotional, but a great experience. And then I think he had mentioned, he had told us, uh, well, go check out Gold's Gym, go check out Muscle Beach and I will see you uh, the following day. So yeah. um, we ended up on uh, the movie set of Last Action Hero. It turned out that Arnold wasn't needed for a lot of filming on that particular day. I remember just being kind of amazed and overwhelmed at just how big these Hollywood movie productions actually are. All of the lights, the wires, the technicians, uh, just absolutely incredible. And uh, they did a close-up uh, scene with the camera scene with Arnold just sitting in the car. He had a very intense look on his face. And they must have uh, done that maybe 10 different takes from various angles. And it really wasn't much uh, filming at all, but that didn't matter because Arnold said, come with me, I want to introduce you to a very good friend of mine. And we ended up walking right next door where he introduces us to Clint Eastwood, who is filming the movie In the Line of Fire. Yeah. And I uh, got a great uh, Polaroid of, uh, of me with uh, Clint Eastwood as well. So this just was absolutely, positively uh, incredible. So, so far I met Joe Gold, Arnold, and now Clint Eastwood. So huh. that's that was great. Scott, was this at Paramount Studios, or where was this all happening? You know, I believe it was Universal. Universal, okay. Universal, yeah. Help me. I, I could be wrong on that. I, I could I could be wrong on that. But um, I remember Arnold joking with Clint. Now, Clint Eastwood and Rene Russo were in the midst of getting ready to film a scene here. Yeah. And, and no other, someone that Schwarzenegger could just barge right in <laughs> with an like seven or eight people. I mean, nobody's going to stop him. Right. But they, they were in the midst of production, and uh, you could tell immediately that how good of friends that they were. And uh, Clint, I took the time to take Polaroid pictures. Again, I'm saying Polaroid. I can't believe I'm 50 <laughs> old here. Um, but it just, it was great. And I remember Arnold joking with Clint. Arnold was absolutely amazed that Clint's food catering service, they were grilling steaks, all right? <laughs> I mean, the smell was just absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. And uh, Arnold teased on me. He said, you know, how can you do this? You're giving great steaks to hundreds of people here. And uh, I, I remember that quite well. <laughs> because uh, Clint actually uh, preceded Arnold in politics. He became mayor of Carmel, California. I want to say it was around that time, early 90s maybe. And I think, uh, you know, I don't know for sure. I haven't read all the biographies in a while, but that probably had something to do with Arnold himself pursuing uh, the, the governor's seat of California a few years later. But uh, interesting yeah. that they were good friends and they both had those two things in common, major, major motion picture stars and major politicians. Yeah, and another name that comes to mind is uh, Jesse Ventura as well. Yep. Uh, he became, uh, I believe it was a governor, correct? Uh, Minnesota, yeah. Uh, Minnesota, correct. He was in Predator with Arnold. <laughs> Absolutely, and that, that is one of my favorite movies. Oh, Absolutely cool. awesome. You know, I just thought I would mention this, but definitely uh, Predator, Total Recall, 
Terminator 2, Terminator 1. Those really are my top four. Well, uh, Conan. Yeah, absolutely. I did like Conan, um, but I got to say, I'm more of a fan of the Terminator movies, which I believe that Arnold right now, it's already in production. Um, so I believe that they're, they're filming or getting ready to film yeah. the next installment of Terminator. So I am very excited. Uh, I did want to mention one, one thing right here. Since I saw him in early December, yeah. it was around Christmas time. I've got a picture to where he's handing me uh, this uh, Christmas present. And it turned out to be a very nice leather notepad uh, that I certainly uh, used uh, throughout uh, college and graduate school. If I had a major research paper or a major presentation to give in front of a group of people, I would take that out kind of as my good luck charm, if you will. And uh, I remember here for when I did the closing on my condo a number of years ago or then the closing on my, my home, yeah. any like big financial transaction, I would always bring this uh, leather notepad in for uh, good luck. So uh, it, it was a great, uh, a great gift that uh, I still use uh, from time to time. You know, as cool of an experience as my two days with Arnold uh, was, and uh, it definitely was, there was going to be a very, very important lesson uh, that, that I would learn uh, from Arnold, but I wouldn't realize it until uh, nearly 20 years later. Now, Ron, I got to say, after you have a trip that big, that excited, there's only a 19-year-old, how do you how do you ever beat something like that? Mm. It's kind of a topic. You know, I look back, and uh, I, I remember here I'd taken about 10 trips to Thailand, two trips to Vietnam. I remember in Hong Kong. I happened to be in Hong Kong on New Year's Eve millennium the turnover of a new millennium, having a seven course meal with a uh, nice wine. And it, it, these were great, great experiences, but it's very, very hard to tap the excitement of a trip of hanging out with Arnold, especially uh, so soon uh, is after uh, Terminator 2. I gotta ask you because so many of us, like I said, I've interviewed him on the phone and I've never, I've been in his presence, I've been a couple feet away from him, but I've never, had the chance to interact face to face with him out of all the all these years but i always got the sense even from those little skirmishes uh, with very little contact that there's something about him that makes him different from just about everybody else he's got a certain charisma a certain magnetism you know you're in the presence of somebody very special uh it's like almost like a power it's almost like a supernatural feeling did you, yeah, did you get did you get that sense when you were around him well, you're absolutely correct. There is this charisma, there is this tremendous force, this presence, yeah. that you are around uh, somebody. I'm going to be bold, and, and please don't laugh. I just got to say this. I firmly believe that Arnold very well may be a genius. And I say that for the following reasons. Yes. Five Mr. Universe titles, seven Mr. Olympias, all right, definitely the most influential bodybuilder. All right, let's put that over there. Then he becomes a, the highest paid action movie star anywhere in the world. So now we're up to two careers to where he's totally at the top, totally at the pinnacle. Right. Then when he took on uh, politics and he became governor of California, which is the very highest political position that being a foreign-born individual could have obtained. Um, that, that's three different fields. And now, we, we could also mention that in uh, the late 70s, I believe it was, that uh, Arnold, the education of a modern bodybuilder, that, that turned out to be on the New York Times bestseller list. We could talk about uh, his business ventures. This was also the time in between Terminator 2 and Last Action Hero, in between 1991 and 1993, how he purchased single-handedly a Boeing 747 from Singapore Airlines 
Singapore Airlines at that time wanted to expand their, their routes and they had to free up capital. And for them to do that, what they were doing essentially was selling off their aircraft, in which then they would lease back and utilize it um, that way. And Arnold actually uh, purchased uh, a Boeing 747, not for its own use, mind you, but to lease it back to Singapore Airlines. Hmm. And I believe that he was the very first individual to pull something like that off. And uh, so when you think about his uh, vision for uh, you know, business or, or whatever it is in so many different fields, I have to say that quite positively, uh, he could be at the genius level, definitely with that motivational drive in the phone. There's the one great conversation I wanted to bring up. This was actually um, also at Shatsian Meng. We had ended up there for dinner later. I believe it was on the second day. Um, I had made mention that I was going to take a trip to Thailand. That was my first time back then. Now I've been there nearly a dozen times. But I, I, I had told uh, Arnold, I want to know if he was ever to Thailand. I, I believe he had said no, but he had been to Japan and to mainland China. I visited uh, my father out there who was a uh, business professor at DePaul University. I just got to say hello to everyone at DePaul. I earned two degrees from DePaul. And he uh, still is a business marketing professor. And at that time, he would take a, a group of 20 to 25 MBA business students, and they would travel throughout Asia and Southeast Asia, whether it was to Thailand, Hong Kong, or to Tokyo, Japan. And when I said something about marketing and, and business, I remember Arnold gave me this look. Obviously, I kind of caught his attention, because when you think about it, when it comes to marketing, Arnold definitely is, um, in my opinion, a, a genius, definitely a master of uh, marketing. And uh, he took interest in that conversation, and it meant a lot, because you've got to remember, as a 19-year-old, you're kind of you're kind of worried or self-conscious about how do you approach somebody like Arnold and to hold out a conversation with somebody that's at the, that caliber. Right. But he uh, he enjoyed now the reason why he may have been so focused in my conversation about my upcoming trip uh, to Thailand was that was right at the same time where next door close by Singapore he was purchasing that Boeing 747 jet or it was just recently after he filmed the four or five uh, commercials for five million dollars each in Tokyo Japan yeah I also want to add another dimension to Arnold that, you know, all the, the MD viewers are familiar with is he never turned his back on the sport. It would have been so easy for him to, you know, have nothing to do with bodybuilding ever again. But, you know, together with Jim Lorimer, starting in uh, 1976, the year after he retired for the first time, he became a contest promoter. He promoted a number of Mr. Olympia events with Jim, and then they started their own thing, the Arnold Schwarzenegger Classic, which... We just had the 30th anniversary. It's it's grown into the Arnold Sports Festival. It's got more athletes competing in it than the Olympics, and he's expanded it to all these other continents. I mean, Arnold is just a you know his resume is, it's, it's is, unparalleled. is correct. It's also located in Brazil, yeah. in Spain, South in South Africa, Africa, Asia, in Hong Kong, and Australia, as well as Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. That is absolutely, positively amazing. But it's a little bit more to that. Um, actually, in 1970, when Arnold met Jim Lorimer for the very first time, Arnold was competing in the Mr. World at the Veterans Memorial Auditorium. And this was right after he had won a Mr. Universe title in Europe. I mean, right after. Jim Day after. Mm -hmm. had to provide a private jet for a red-eye flight I believe, to accommodate both Arnold and Franco. Right. And Arnold was so tremendously impressed with the organizational skills of Jim Lorimer. And he may mention that, Jim, this is the best run contest ever. 
And Arnold in 1970 said, as soon as I retire, I want to team up with you and let's do bodybuilding uh, promotions. Right. And sure enough, so he had this vision, uh, you know, in order to spot out people who were truly at the top of their game, such as Jim Lorimer. And it's just absolutely incredible what he's done with the Arnold Sports Festival. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's what it is. If, Genius is kind of a word that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but vision and, and his willpower are probably the two things that really stand out to me is what made Arnold, you know, the, the force that he became because in, in all the biographies, it talks about him being like 14 years old and seeing Reg Park up on the movie screen as Hercules, and at that young age where he's still a, an adolescent, he said, I'm going to be a champion bodybuilder, I'm going to be the best bodybuilder in the world, I'm going to be... A movie star just like Reg Park and he made that happen then he just kept setting goals and achieving them over and over again so yeah what a, what a role model this man has been for everybody I've got a tremendous punchline for you and your audience oh yes that's right yeah I talked about this incredible experience about predicting uh, I was gonna win the trip and actually won the trip on a ticket that was actually given to me talked about what a great experience it was actually hanging out with Arnold and getting uh, introduced to Joe Gold and Clint Eastwood and, and all of that. Um, it happened in 2010. I was at Carl Schurz High School where I teach. I want to say hello to everyone at Carl Schurz High School in Chicago. I'm walking up a flight of stairs. This was at the very end of the academic school year. And I, my, both my wife and I, uh, we were scheduled to fly to Thailand literally within about six days' time from when this happened. And I'm walking up the third flight of stairs, and I just, something wasn't quite right. I had a little bit of a shortness of breath. And I always knew from my training, it's the mind and the muscle connection. Like the mind and the muscle get to connect as one. If you really want to train properly. So I, I kind of knew mind, muscle. I'm climbing up the stairs and I got a little bit dizzy, had a shortness of breath. Uh, I just knew that something, it wasn't major, but something, yeah, I, I took notice. Yeah. So I did the very, very wise thing. I immediately scheduled the following day an appointment to go in uh, for a checkup. And, uh, that the last thing I wanted to do was to be on a commercial aircraft at 30,000 feet and then for whatever reason suffer shortness of breath. You know, traveling to Southeast Asia is no joke. Usually I, I fly Chicago to Tokyo, Japan, that's 12 hours. You got a three or maybe a four hour layover there. Then it's another six hours from Tokyo, Japan to Bangkok, Thailand. When you're in Thailand, you're immediately faced with a 12-hour time zone difference. So door-to-door -door with customs, with the taxis and all of that, it takes about 27 hours. So I knew I, I, I got to get this checked out. So the following day after work, I showed up in the afternoon. And um, not that I was old, I, I think I was about maybe 37, 38 years of age at the time. Yeah. I'm not old by any means, but I couldn't believe this doctor, she was so young, she was doing her residency. And I was explaining, all right, um, some of the symptoms and what had happened. I was at work, I'm climbing the stairs on that third flight. And she had looked at me with such an intensity and then asked me to repeat several things. And then she asked follow-up questions. And I'll never forget, she took out the stethoscope and she was listening to my heart for an extended period of time. Told me to turn around so she could listen to my back. And then flip around again. And so she's listening to my heart. Well, you know, after about four or five minutes, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out something probably not right here. So after about four or five minutes of this, um, she very calmly said, she, I, I don't want to alarm you, so you know, don't get you know freaked out or 
anything like that, but uh, I did detect a very, very subtle heart murmur. Hmm. And she said it's very faint. It's almost impossible to hear, but I've heard it. I've heard something. Yeah. And she said, uh, uh, wait here, I'll be right back. Well, a couple of minutes later, uh, in walks in three other doctors who were going through their student training. And they each took turns listening to my heart. Two of them could actually hear the subtle murmur. The third one never could. Uh, mm -hmm. But definitely, I had explained to her, I said, please, if at all possible, I'll go through any tests. But in five days' time, I've got a prepaid uh, trip already scheduled for Thailand. I have the airline tickets already bought, everything. Right? It's like, it's like $10,000, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I want to take the trip if, if I could take the trip. Right. So the, uh, the following day, they quickly, they pulled out the red carpet service and uh, the uh, echocardiogram was scheduled. And um, I, I remember I returned right back from the echocardiogram when I got a phone call from her again asking me to come back to the hospital, uh, which I knew at the doctor's office, which I did. So one thing led to another, and as a long story short, it turns out that um, I have an aortic heart valve defect. Mm. It's congenital. It's stemming from a bicuspid valve instead of a tricuspid leaflet. And what happens is generally people in their 40s or 50s, the valve kind of calcifies, and as it becomes more brittle, there's leakage into the chamber of the heart. And uh, this is something uh, that, that I was born with, but you know, I just put two and two together. Because I remember back in 1997, when Arnold had to get his aortic heart valve uh, replaced, yeah. and he did a tremendous, tremendous job of recovering from that and keeping physically active and fit after that. And then uh, heart valve, so bottom line is this, um, I even met with a surgeon and they had wanted to do this um, open heart surgery on me. Uh, and this would have been nearly eight years ago. But I knew with something this big, you've got to get a second, a third, or maybe even which I did, I got a fourth medical opinion. And they all agree that it's an aortic heart valve defect and that it definitely needs to be uh, replaced, but it, it didn't have to be done right away. So it's a very good thing that I had a double check yet. And I want to say that some of these things just happen. They could either be hereditary or you're just born with it, and it has nothing, nothing to do with steroids. You know, I've heard uh, throughout the years, a lot of people always blaming Arnold's condition on anabolic uh, steroids when uh, actually his mom had a, a, you know, a hereditary uh, heart valve problem as well. And so did leave his grandmother. So uh, it, that's definitely one thing uh, that I need. So I gotta go in every year for a stress echocardiogram and they, they gotta uh, keep an eye on it. So. Generally, you to get a mechanical valve, which will last 35 or 40 years. I mean, that right. Problem is, you've got to go on blood thinners. Hmm. And when you're on blood thinners, you get that's daily. You got to monitor your blood. There are certain vegetables even that you can't eat. And then, right. God forbid, if you got into uh, some kind of an accident, you were to get injured or cut, you could actually bleed out. So hmm. the best at least for me, is a tissue valve. And usually uh, tissue valves uh, last anywhere from 15 to 20 years. I just gotta say one thing, because it bothered me, because when Arnold recently went to get his um, valve redone, okay, yeah. a lot of people were, uh, the media, you know, emergency, open heart surgery, emergency this, emergency that, nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. The bottom mm -hmm. line, he got his first procedure done in 1997. These valves again last usually 15 years. His yeah. 21 years. Hmm. And what eventually, so it definitely outlived its usefulness. 
So when he went to uh, get a new one, they were going to try to use an experimental, less invasive procedure, a catheter procedure. Now, the thing is, it's relatively new. They've been doing it in Europe for quite a few years, but it's relatively new here in the States. And the thing is, it's very experimental. So obviously, they had an open heart surgical thing on standby, just in case if the less invasive uh, procedure didn't work for him. Hmm. So, I mean, I was kind of taken aback by how the media portrayed that as a was an emergency open heart danger. Nothing could be further from the truth. He knew what he was doing, so did his surgical team. And it's just great. It's uh, inspirational to see how well now, at 71 years of age, that he's recovered. So definitely, I'm using a lot of his lessons um, in recovery. I'm going to apply that to my own uh, situation as well. So now, Scott, you have not had the procedure done yet at all? I haven't, I haven't had it done. A, a surgeon wanted me to do it back in 2010. Can you believe yeah. that? Eight years ago. And that's why I'm going to, you know, just mention to people, always get a second, a third medical opinion. You know, my current team of doctors, have, well, they all agree it needs to be done at some point. But this is something that uh, doesn't happen all of a sudden. It's gradual, although I do need to go in every year for a stress echocardiogram because what happens is generally the, the, valve, the, the aortic valve calcified, which means there is a little leakage into the chamber of the heart. And yeah. so naturally then the heart's got to pump a little bit harder. So then the left side of the heart grows. Um, it expands a little bit, and that's what they got to measure and to keep a very close watch on. So the prognosis, don't get me wrong, the prognosis is very, very good, uh, but definitely, and, and I do an excellent job of putting it out of my mind for maybe six months or seven months or eight months, um, but every once in a while, I will have a dream or I'll wake up at like two or three uh, in, in the morning and just kind of with this realization, ah, you know, at some point, I'm going to need open heart surgery. Yeah. But I'm still working on, I'm still able to do uh, you know, 300 pound bench presses and, and all of that. Um, That's 300 pounds more than me, so you're doing pretty well. <laughs> Absolutely. Good job. So, well, you know, I, I urge you, uh, if you have time, we do a show every week. Uh, I do a show with Dr. Thomas O'Connor called Ask the Anabolic Doc. It's geared mostly toward people who have used steroids or are using steroids who want to stay as healthy as possible. But we do discuss, the doctor discusses uh, a lot of heart maintenance, uh, heart health issues. It's, it's, it's something you might find interesting because, you know, people our age, you're, you're a little younger, but not that much younger. Uh, the heart is really the thing we need to be most concerned with. It's still the leading cause of death. And uh, I just had a whole battery of tests, the echo and the all that good stuff, the calcium score done on mine, just to make sure everything was, you know, I wasn't any in any grave danger. But uh, it's an interesting show. I urge you to check it out if you ever have time. It's on the MD site called Ask the Anabolic Doc. We do it every Thursday. Right. But, but uh, Scott, I thank you so much for your time and for sharing all these stories. Well, I, I thank you. You know, this is a great honor. I've been so excited about this, uh, to be able to speak to an audience, people who know, you know, what, what a legend Arnold actually is, and people that are passionate about the sport, and most importantly, the art of bodybuilding. And I really felt that maybe this story would appeal to your audience. Yeah, I'm curious, Scott, do you still follow the sport? Do you, are you still a fan of it? You know, not only do I, I follow it, but, um, you know, I just love uh, the history of bodybuilding as well. So I watch a lot of, you know, uh, uh, YouTube uh, documentaries and interviews. Um, John Hansen on the Bodybuilding's Legend Show, yeah. he was a natural competitor, uh, natural Mr. Universe as well as a natural um, Mr. Olympia. Right. He's done uh, some remarkable interviews with a lot of the, the past Mr. Olympia uh, champions as well as Mr. Universe uh, title uh, holders. 
you know, I've enjoyed your show. I've enjoyed Rick Tracing. So there's a lot of great material out there. You know, I do follow. I do follow a bodybuilding, and I got to thank someone who made a return to bodybuilding just a couple of years ago for really getting me excited. And that's Kevin Lavrone. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I remember in 1992 at the Arnold Classic, I saw Vince Taylor won. Then in 1993, I saw Flex Wheeler one, who I believe was the best physique I've ever seen, mm -hmm. that 1993's uh, physique. Then in 1994, I saw Kevin Lebroni uh, win. And uh, when I heard that he was going to make a comeback a couple of years ago, definitely uh, I took notice. So I do follow uh, bodybuilding, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, cool. Cool to hear. Well, it's been a, it's been a great story that you told. I Appreciate you sharing it with all of us, and uh, that's it. Thank you so much, Great, everybody. Out th I want to thank everyone out there for watching. Please subscribe to the story, uh, to the uh, to the YouTube channel that you're watching right now, the Muscular Development one. So for the Ron Line Report, this has been Ron Harris with Scott Barron. Thanks for watching.